Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the first plenary session of uh, the conference. And we are delighted to have uh, Dr. Robin Murphy with us, uh, who will be talking to us about a very interesting uh, topic, uh, which is also pretty timely, actually, as far as the theme of this particular conference is concerned. So before I um, hand over to, to her, I'd like to say a few things um, about her. So uh, for uh, uh, I'm sure all of you know her very well, uh, but uh, yet again, uh, Dr. Robin Murphy uh, is the um, Raytheon Professor of Computer Science and Engineering um, at the Texas A&M University, uh, a TAD speaker and an IEEE and ACM fellow. Uh, she helped create the fields of disaster robotics and human robot interaction, deploying robots to 29 disasters uh, in five countries, including 9 11 World Trade Center, um, Fukushima, the Syrian boat refugee crisis, Hurricane Harvey, and the uh, Kilauea uh, volcanic eruption. Uh, Murphy's contributions to robotics have been recognized with the ACM uh, Eugene uh, L. Lawler uh, Award for humanitarian uh, contributions, a U.S. Air Force uh, Exemplary Civilian uh, Service Award Medal, the AU VSI Foundation's AI Aubie Award, and the Motohiro uh, Kisoi Award for Rescue Engineering Education in uh, Japan. Uh, she has written the best-selling textbook, Introduction to AI Robotics, uh, second edition in 2019, and the award-winning Disaster Robotics in 2014. Uh, plus, uh, she is serving as editor uh, for science fiction, uh, science fact focus series for the Journal of Science Robotics. Uh, so we are delighted to have her here and I'll hand over to her to enlighten us on the topic of categorizing extreme environments and predicting success. Uh, over thank to you, you Robert. Thank you, Osman. And thank you all for having me here. Yeah, I, I don't do climbing or walking robots, but what I do disasters. And so what I'm hoping to do is show you some of the things that we see in the field so that you can take all the fantastic work you're doing uh, and apply that to there. Some of this I'm sure you already know, but some you may not. So hopefully I'll start a good discussion on that. If you're not familiar with Texas A&M, I'm at Texas A&M, it's near Houston. It's actually between Houston and Austin, Texas. And we're one of the largest uh, engineering schools in the United States. What's really even more special is that we are actually the, uh, uh, the Texas Department of Emergency Management. We actually are the state agency that does disasters. And since 1929, we've been training people all over the world on how to do, uh, how to work in emergencies. And we have a huge complex called Disaster City that has almost every type of disaster collapsed buildings, collapsed office buildings, houses that have blown over, general rubble, those sorts of things. So it's my favorite place on earth. But let me talk about what we're gonna do. What I wanna talk about first off is that these extreme environments, things like disasters, uh, how do you characterize them in a, particularly in a way that may be useful to you as working with walking, climbing robots, uh, and I want to use the recent Surfside, Florida, the Miami building collapse. We helped participate with that. And so I've got some insights there. And then how do you predict success? So if you build a robot that can handle these extreme uh, environments and you are asked to deploy to a new one, how would you be able to say, uh, yeah, sure, this will work or it won't work? And in the ramification, that means for test beds that are going to support prediction and uh, in comparison. And then what are the opportunities, just very briefly for legged and climbing robots? I mean, you, that's your area, you'll know, but some things that I see. All right, here's a video 
from Surfside. I don't know if you, you know, so the Surfside collapse was the third largest building collapse in the United States and loss of life. It was World Trade Center, the, the Oklahoma City bombing, the, the collapse of the Murrah building, and then Surfside where 98 people lost their lives uh, back in, in um, uh, July. So let's, uh, let's just show this. And because I'm gonna be going talking about the different types of rubble, I wanna show this video because it both shows the collapse and then talks about the three different areas. And because we're gonna keep coming back to those three different areas on this one block wide pile. So let's see if I can get, all right, let's, let's play that. So you see there are really three different areas. Uh, well, perhaps four. There's the building that's still standing, the part in the middle, the pancake collapse, and then around the garage. Okay, let's see, get back here. All right, so the standing structure, there's the underground parking, the pancake, and the lean-to voids. And I want to talk about each of these and what this means in terms of extreme environments. All right, so the standing structure was clearly intact, but it was highly unstable. Humans did go in and look and try to rescue, see if anybody was there, and quickly, as fast as they could, go through that. So you see that there was uh, a lot of shaking and stuff, and almost all the, the uh, very few condos were not damaged in some way. Now, an interesting aspect about the standing structure, this is, you can see down below on the backside in a picture of a cat. So people were sent into a search and they very quickly risked their lives to go in there. Uh, about two weeks into the collapse, uh, we, somebody saw a cat on one of the buildings uh, and this picture of Coco. And there were definitely people had, you know, had literally 90 seconds to flee when they heard the nod. The ones that survived were the ones who were making it to the stairwell. And, and they left pets behind and important possessions and stuff. So there became this really big push to try to find the, the uh, pets. So going back into the building to look for pets turned out to be uh, a big deal. We did a lot of flying of UAVs to go in. There weren't a lot of ground robots used on this and I'll talk about why. Now, here's the underground parking garage portion. You saw that was what was the pool deck and had those punch through columns. Well, you could see from the pictures, you could get underneath there into the garage for most of the garage. 
and humans did and could partially search it, but they didn't spend a lot of time there because it was the collapse happened at 1 30 in the morning there's not a lot of people over there and of course when you're racing against the clock you want to go where most of the survivors are and that's going to be in the standing structure or the are uh you know the other ones now the pancake collapse is a pancake literally there's only a few centimeters of spacing between the layers there's no human access you're walking around the top you're hoping to find a void where the the pancake those slabs of floor have uh somehow miraculously been enough space for a human to do but the one where you're really going to find and we had two indications of trap survivors that they couldn't get to in time and that is this lean to collapse and you can see it's very dangerous there. It's uh, There are some voids that a person might have been able to crawl in on their belly to go look for, but it was just way too dangerous. And in fact, they were thinking that the lean-to collapse, all of that kind of angle was actually holding up the uh, standing portion of the structure. So what does that mean? Um, I think the first thing for y'all to think about, for you all to think about is that, that there was sure there's some need to have robots that can crawl on top of the rubble, but the bigger need is to have robots that can transverse within voids in the rubble. So I think that's the big, big takeaway there. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, and as you look, see, you know, these are the type when we say, go through the rubble, look, look how homogeneous, heterogeneous the material is and, and the challenges. So let's talk about that some more. So how do we actually characterize those environments? And I have been trying to figure out a formal scientific way of characterizing what I see in the field at these different disasters. And the, the, the big publication on this is the book from MIT Press, Disaster Robotics. So for me, I see that for the environment, characterizing it, I typically think of it as scale. I mean, is the robot actually going to fit into the smallest part of a void? And then there's this idea of regions, that the voids may have different areas with different properties within them. And then traversability, uh, will the robot be able to actually move once it's there? And if at all possible, I want to try to develop dimensionless numbers like the Reynolds number or the Stokes number, because that makes it easier to compare different types of robots or different types of environments. So let's go back and look at this in terms of robotics. Uh, mostly, it was, this was a huge use of unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, only a couple of uses of ground robots, and those were in the garage area. Now, if in the standing structure, this would have been fine for human-sized robots. There was a lot of clearance in there. Uh, if we look at the underground parking, again, a human or a dog could fit in there. If we're talking about the pancake, we're talking about a very small snake robot, such as the active scope camera from Japan. Uh, but you can think of a, a rodent or an insect or a live snake being able to get in there. And in those lean-to voids, if you were if you were an animal, something along the lines of a, a dog or a ferret, particularly I love ferrets, the idea that they can be snakes and they can be you know, legged uh, creatures at the same time, uh, but that they, the voids are very irregular. All right, so that's great, but let's be more precise because, of course, leg robots come in different sizes. The voids are unpredictable in size. And so for me, the questions are, will a robot that works in one of these void spaces work in another one? And will a smaller version, if you have a great robot that's working, can you just shrink it, you know, come up with a smaller version to work in that more restricted space? And if so, what size would you make it be? Uh, and then finally, you know, if you're given a void, will the robot work and will it work well or will it struggle? So the first thing that we've done is look at this idea of scale. And we've tried to create a dimensionless number to rate the size of the environment to the agent. Now, if the agent's a human, let's, let's talk about a human. A human has a character characteristic dimension and we think of that as usually their shoulder width. And that means that if, if, uh, if I can always turn, if I've got enough shoulder width, I can typically turn around in an environment and crawl back out. So what we say is that if, let's start at the, the right, 
it, habitable, or, habitable or exterior areas are where the environment's characteristic dimension is at least two times larger than that person's characteristic dimension, their shoulder width. And if it is, there's, there's no problem. They can move around freely in that environment. A restricted mobility area is where they can still fit, but it's less than two uh, widths. And that is what the Occupational Health and Safety uh, Administrations all over the world call a confined space. You can crawl in, but you can't turn around. So you have to crawl backwards, which is very slow and means it's more dangerous should something happen. Okay. And then the third area on the left is granular, where you're actually burrowing into it. You don't have any clearance. The environment is actually smaller than you and you have to do. And you see things like sandworms and such. And uh, Daniel Goldman over at uh, Georgia Tech has been doing a lot of work in that area. All right. So, you know, for, and if we think about agents as robots, we start looking at the robot scale. Fukushima there uh, the robots were things like the pack bots were working in an area that was human size, so they could easily fit. But if we think about things like the Elios uh, UAV, that's built to go in very narrow areas and actually with that cage built to go into things as big, as, only as big as its cage and use the cage to roll around it as it flies. And then we don't have any robots that I'm aware of that are capable of working in granular uh, regions. So think of it this way, you know, is that the, uh, we start off with going from left to right, granular where the robot would have to be burrowing through, the robot uh, restricted maneuverability where the robot crawls or squeezes through, and then habitable or exterior where the robot can move freely. That's never thought of a good name for that, but basically it could be indoors or outdoors. It's just a very large area. So let's talk about this in terms of a legged robot. Uh, Spot wasn't used. Uh, the only robots I'm aware we used were uh, Bomb Squad, F6A, uh, classic tracked one. But let's talk about if we were going to use Spot to go over the rubble. And we can see these are rough dimensions. So I'm not sure what the turning radius was. I assumed it was about 1.1 meter for it to be able to turn around, uh, which means for that. So Outside, on top of the rubble, no problem. It's clearly in that exterior where the environment is uh, much larger than the, uh, the agent. Now, if we start looking at putting it into the condo and searching inside the damaged part of the standing structure, uh, you, you typically take the smallest cross section and you start seeing now we're getting into the restricted maneuverability. So, it's no longer working in a totally open area. And so, but it still, still should work fine. It's got a ratio of 1.16. Now, if we go here, let's look at these voids. So the voids we're gonna say are roughly uh, 0.75 meters by 1.2 meters. I've not done the photogrammetrics. This is just a, a, rough, a rough estimate right now. I am, I've got a small grant from the National Science Foundation to go back and look at these void sizes. So we're working on getting the more accurate imagery, but we look at the environment. So roughly saying the environment cross section is 1.2 meters and that agent uh, spot is characteristic image 1.1. That means we're basically at a, about a one ratio, which is very close to granular. The robot squeezing it doesn't have its normal uses. Uh, and then inside that pancake collapse, I mean, the only few voids that you could see in the pancake portion of the collapse are on the order of about uh, 0.58 meters for a cross section. So, you know, spot won't fit in there. Uh, it, would, it would have to be all of a sudden be something that could lift and move as it went. Okay, some observations. So the restricted maneuverability is actually where you want to work, right? If you're working on a disaster, because that's the areas where you have likelihood of survivors 
but we can't as people go there. It's too unsafe or too small for us to get in there. So smaller robots to get in there and it's still gonna be restricted. The smaller, the better because we have smaller and smaller voids. Well, the problem is, is that as a roboticist, your robot may get stuck. Uh, and what are you gonna do about it? Also, since you're so close, uh, the sensors may not, particularly a time of flight sensor may not work. Uh, or you're so close you can't tell what you're looking at. And the operator's viewpoint is restricted. You're asking them to literally have tunnel vision to, to look through a keyhole. And then the options for recovery are limited. You can't turn around and walk back. Uh, you, you may, you know, how, how you handle that becomes very challenging. So now let's talk about regions. When we think of regions, typically you think of the area you go into, how you get out, and any changes in the robot's work envelope as we go. And, and so this scale is, is complicated by regions. And so this is a cross-section of the cranial collapse, mine, uh, cranial canyon mine collapse. And there were really three different regions that had different traversability characteristics and size. And of course, you can't exactly, the problem with all of this is that you, you really find a lot of this at ho post hoc after the disaster. In the case of the Cranial Canyon, you were first off going through a very narrow borehole. Then you had to go through this uh, where, the, where the drill into the mine had cut through fencing and unstable ceiling. And then once you dropped to the floor, the mine floor, then you were kind of on level ground and it was a little muddy uh, to deal with. So the big point is, is that a void will often contain at least two regions where the environment changes both its shape and the traversability characteristics. And we'll talk about traversability a little bit later. So in, in looking at eight out of the 13 uh, unmanned ground vehicle deployments I could find, uh, they had at least two regions. And, and we saw that at the Thai cave rescue, right? You, you saw they were, oh, we're gonna build, uh, I think Elon Musk built an amphibian, uh, an underwater robot to go, but it needed to be an amphibian because there were parts that were underwater and parts above water and parts that were climbing and parts that were swimming. So let's talk about that idea of traversability. We talked about scale, that we have these regions, but within, you know, a void will have multiple regions, but what does it mean to be traversability and, and will the robot be able to move? And so we look at traversability as uh, in these, these uh, five different properties. So one of the big properties of a void that we see that, that most roboticists don't account for is tortuosity, and that is turns, the amount of turns. And that is, tortuosity is a, is a term from animal behavior. It's a fractal number to measure the paths. Uh, they use that in animals to say whether an animal's turning a lot or running straight. And so this is uh, some work with an unmanned aerial vehicle. It just shows that the turns that this, this aerial vehicle has to do is up and down and around. So it's not just a turn to the left or turn to the right, it can be a three-dimensional turn. And it's the number of turns per unit distance. And so, you know, of course, turns are bad, right? Because you get more odometry area and there's also more potential for collisions because we have uh, blind spots. And just an example at Disaster City, you can see, wait, if you're trying to do an unmanned aerial system through here, you're gonna have lots of turns to get from one area to the other uh, and to avoid and to search and to just get there. And you can also see the same thing with the ground robot. All right, so now going back the uh, vertical uh, access and things, uh, Verticality is really important in disasters because the rescue or the extrication effort, once you find a victim, which you normally find with a dog, not a robot, you're usually on top of that rubble, working down, drilling down or breaching down. And, and also as you follow a void, a voids are often that you're, since you're trying to work down, they'll have different verticality. Um, also, you're gonna see surface properties. So one of the things about the DARPA Robotics Challenge uh, that many people were like, oh, look, we can step over these, these complex 
areas that are either concrete or wood. Well, we never get that, okay? We never get concrete or wood. We get concrete with gravel, with sheetrock. Uh, things are not stable. So if you step on something, it may slip out from under your feet. Often uh, a, a building collapse is wet because think if you're in an office building right now, if that building collapse, the sprinklers are gonna come on. And if it collapses all the way, all the water fountains and all the bathrooms, all that water goes somewhere. And if you've got a lot of concrete, which most commercial buildings do, that concrete, the, the, the rubble, uh, the, the pulverized concrete often becomes acidic. It becomes like a little muddy slurry thing that actually starts eroding on your robots. So there is surface property. Another thing to think of is your obstacles and the severity of the obstacles, particularly as you're trying to categorize risk. So one is if you your robot bumps into something or hits something or moves something, is there a problem? Is that the, in a nuclear operating power plant, that's one of their biggest fears is that a robot's going to touch something or hit something that it shouldn't and cause a problem that they can't fix. Another one is collision, how does that impact the robot? Particularly, you've got an obstacle that's large and easy, but if it's got sharp edges, the consequence of colliding with it is much higher than the consequence of hitting a wall. And then you've got the, the obstacles. There's, can you perceive the obstacles? As I said, if you're working in that restricted mobility, maneuverability area, you may be inside the minimum distance for a time of flight sensor. Uh, also, if you're expecting the human to figure out what's going on, it's usually too close uh, or a natural viewpoint for a human to comprehend. So it's very hard to tell. I mean, looking at that, this is from, you know, can the robot go over that grading? How big is that grading? What are those, what are those structures in front of us? What happens? Another one is accessibility elements like doors, right? We remember this from from Fukushima, fairly famous uh, footage there. And so we call accessibility elements are generally architectural elements, things like doors or stairs. And the problem with the doors is that they can be closed. Uh, and you see there as well, have, they might have a raised threshold. And in, in uh, apartments, the bathroom doors are often much, much narrower than the front door. So the doors can be of different sizes. And of course, we all know about stairs. And then another thing in accessibility is that sometimes going back to the responders, they'll drill holes, uh, they'll, they'll core into the concrete trying to, to see if there's a void down below. So that's an accessibility element. And you've got to think about those. Now, if you were just thinking about human-sized robots, you can kind of put this scale of the region going from left to right and with the increasing traversability going from bottom to top. So you can see a granular area uh, typically is going to, the human just aren't going to be able to get in. And that's usually going to be your pipes, shafts, or very uh, If you look at the restricted mobility areas, uh, there people can get in with special training or procedures. They may be repelling, they may do tunnels, uh, they, they may be wearing a lot of equipment. And then the exterior areas, that's kind of normal uh, movements. It's built for that. So if you look at that in terms of robots, relatively small robots are the only option for the, the more we move toward granular areas. But robots can be similar in size to a person or uh, a dog in the restricted mobility area, but they've got to be more efficient than humans because humans can already do that job. It just made up there. And then in general, you wouldn't use robots for a disaster for anything that, that a person can easily get through unless there's just extreme safety constraints like the radiation at Fukushima. So again, that restricted mobility becomes really important to be able to do that quickly. I mean, where the robot moves faster than a human. So that's the big takeaway there, that somewhere in this area is where we really need more robotics. 3D, the high verticality, uh, the ability to work in more confined spaces. 
All right. So here's another way to look at that. Um, and we can see the ramifications for how we test. So one of my graduate students, Chu Su Chow, now Dr. Chu Su Chow at uh, George Mason University, did an analysis of snake robots. I know it's snake robots, not, not walking uh, or climbing robots, but I think that's probably true with, with the literature in general. You know, they found 20 different test beds to test 12 different snake bots reported into 31 papers, and not a single one of those test beds was actually very useful for comparing different robots. Uh, it was all about, hey, look, I proved my robot does really well for this situation. And the second concern was they were only predicting uh, performance for very benign conditions. They weren't predicting performance for extreme conditions. I'm going to make a robot that's going to work in search and rescue, and it's going to be able to go up a piece of plywood. Okay, that's not even very realistic. So the conclusion was, if you want to measure the performance of your robot, you want to, want to build test beds that have high physical fidelity, particularly scale, and that the robot's going to have to go through multiple regions, and those regions will have very different surface properties, you know, like, like being wet, like being slippery, and they will have different verticality. And if the goal is to compare different robots, then you're going to need to, you know, big robots and comparing with small robots, then you're going to need to change those cross-sectional scale and your link scale and those things have a robot, uh, a test bed that can adjust because otherwise you're not doing a fair comparison. So another thing that, that Chusu looked at was how to predict success. And this is what I often get, you know, one of the things that call me into robotics uh, to disasters is sometimes less to deploy one of my robots, but to help them sort through which robots are likely to work and why. So the best example I can give is to go back to the Crandall Canyon uh, case. And we found eight different areas where things could go wrong. And almost every single one of those areas was, was a point of failure during the the 10 day operation where robots failed. So one thing you probably think of is that what we see in the literature is typically what's the risk and forming that risk is the probability of completing the path. Well, the risk is typically figured only from the, the state. How safe is the environment? I've got this path and it's a perfect path, but uh, you know, what are something about the state of the environment that may impact the robot. And in this case, we saw that the borehole that the robot's going down through the, to get to the mine floor might collapse. Uh, there might be lots and lots of water, so the sensors don't work as right, uh, and that it just has uh, the ceiling itself could collapse. Or when it lands into that pile of drilling mud, the sensors get covered. Another one though is, and this is what, uh, we see is not well captured in the literature is what's the risk from taking an action. So anytime I move that robot, I may be, I can, may have a set of choice of actions, some of which are optimal for a path planning standpoint, but impose more risk. So I want to avoid the ceiling fencing if I, if I can, which I couldn't, uh, because that's the only way you could get down there but it might snag on the fencing or it might get stuck in the drilling debris if it's turned too hard or if it's in, if it's working in a muddy area, a track, these are track vehicles, a track may come off. And then finally, if you're working with tethered robots, which a lot of times for power and communications, you'll have a tether. And if you've got a lot of ver verticality, you're actually repelling, then you have the history of the traversal the tether may tangle or break because you've now put so many you know, edges and going around so many obstacles and corners. And the big insight here is that not all of the risks are conditionally independent. So you can't just put them in, you know, multiply the risk, uh, estimate the probabilities and just multiply. And instead, what he looked at doing was is that you have uh, you have some that are independent and some that are dependent. And you can combine those mathematically. You just have to, uh, it's just more complicated. So 
Let me go ahead and wrap up here uh, and I'm happy to answer questions. I don't know what the opportunities are for legged and climbing robots, but I bet you do. But some of the things that I see as we try to look at those very hard areas is, is hybrid mobility. One of the things is that it's, it's, it's not either or, you're either doing walking or climbing. It's you're, you're walking some parts, you're crawling in some parts, you're climbing or repelling in others. You may be wiggling or doing the breaststroke with your legs to push you forward. So it's hybrid. I think hybrid mobility is going to be there. And speaking of that, uh, autonomous gait and mobility control, as you go from these different regions, the gait you start out with may not be the correct gait for the next area you get to. And it's very hard for people to see and comprehend these dark cluttered areas. So we really need autonomy for that. And then we also see autonomous uh, actions opening a door, uh, getting through a door frame, these, these very common slowing down and being very careful as you go through doors or going upstairs, the operator just can't see what's going on. So those need to be autonomous. And remember, if you're developing a, you know, with the idea that you're gonna develop a complete usable robot for extreme conditions, please, please, please be aware, it has to work. It has to be a complete usable robot. It, no one cares that you've got fantastic joints or this one part, the whole thing has to work. And when you build a robot, we, we often see a lot of roboticists get wonderful mobility, but forget about the sensors and their placement, both for control, but also the point of the robot is generally for the responders to be able to see and comprehend the environment so that they can manage the searching for survivors or manage looking around to see uh, the structural properties to make sure that as they remove rubble to get to a survivor, they're not uh, fixing to cause a secondary collapse. So that's what I have. Uh, we'd love to work with you. There's lots of possibilities where we're going to have an event at Disaster City where you can bring your robots to crawl and climb and walk over the different types of rubble, the different types of collapses. And there's a lot of work out there uh, to look at that. So I'm gonna uh, close and go to uh, questions at this point. Thank you very much. That was a very inspiring and interesting uh, presentation. So um, yeah, I think uh, there are lots of opportunities we see with the uh, mobile robots. Uh, so um, including of course, walking, climbing and um, Flying robots would, would be another level, of course. Uh, so I'm inviting now colleagues uh, for questions. So when you think about climbing, uh, as you climb over like that standing portion of the structure, you know, wouldn't that have been great to climb up into the building? But remember, you saw those railings around on one side, <laughs> the side that was still standing. You got to get over and through the railings and then get in there. So you, you can get up the wall, but then you've got these transition points. And if you can't handle the transition points, it, it won't work. So I think that's that's a that's another set of challenges there. Sure, sure. And I think one of the other points which you noted, which you pointed out, is the sensing mechanism. I think which is very important as well uh, in in these scenarios as well. Uh, I do also, of course. Um, like the idea of uh, hybrid mobility uh, because of the various sort of challenges which you have in a certain disaster environment. Uh, of course, you can't do with, with one kind of mobility, but it has to be a combination, I think, of, of different types, which is good. Well, typically, okay. I've not been a fan of legged robots for disasters because right. most of the work has been, oh, look, we can climb over rubble. You know, people can climb over rubble. Normally, that's not the big win. We did see at Surfside uh, a robot used to climb over the rubble uh, that needed to place a wireless repeater to enable some of the UAVs to work and for connectivity for the for the different responders. The robot was an F6A, one of the classic um, bomb squad robots, but it, it's a bit top heavy. And so it couldn't climb the robot uh, rubble. They actually had to put it on a crane and move it to the center of the 
of the rubble. So, so now I'm saying, okay, yeah, we need to work more on, on climbing rubble. And I believe many of the legged robots that y'all have developed would have worked for that much better. Okay, okay any questions? Yes, Osmond. Uh, yes, Clive yeah, Lockton here. Hi. I'll ask a question. Uh, hi, Robin. Hi. It's Clive Lockton here. I'm editor of the Industrial Robot Journal. Uh, hi. Um, excellent presentation. I mean, when I look at the videos, I just think this is mission impossible. It just looks, you know, so far. Don't say that. <laughs> Don't say that. Just say it's really uh, hard. It's a challenge. Yeah. The stretch yeah, absolutely. goal. Don't give up. Yeah. Please don't give up. I wasn't trying to make you give up. <laughs> No, 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 no. Uh, I appreciate that. And I must say, it looks, it looks, uh, it's, it's a bit ironic that what actually looks like to me like one of the most fun areas to work in robotics is actually as a result of, of disasters, which is, um, you know, a bit, a bit of an irony there. But I've got a question. Let's assume that somebody comes up with a super duper hybrid robot that can scurry into all of these little places within the building. Uh, what you're trying to establish as I understand it, is where are people uh, within the building? Once you, your hybrid robot has gone inside the building, how can you tell where it's got to? Yeah, that, that's, that's generally the problem. So Clive, let me answer this a long way and, and kind of do a mini tutorial. So normally you find people with dogs. Dogs are excellent at telling you there's somebody alive. What they can't do is tell you where. You're, the, you know, because the scent, think of that big rubble pile, the dog may be, the way the air is flowing through the scent may be over here, but they're there. So now the, uh, the responders try to use sound, they try to use micro, uh, ultra wideband radar, they try to do stuff to locate. Uh, they use uh, cameras on a stick and try to figure out and localize. So you know about where they are, but you've got to better that. So you try to send a robot down now at that point that you've got a survivor, you're trying to get down and, and you're right. What happens at this point is almost always, in fact, I can think of no case for a building collapse that you didn't use a robot or the rubble, the restrictive maneuverability that didn't have a tether. So basically you're doing it, the, uh, you know, I used to be a technical search specialist for Florida Test Force 3. You're uh, in the same way you do with a, one of a borescope. You're just, you're looking, you're saying, hey, I've let out about a meter of tether and I went straight down. So let me sketch that on my rough sketch and then let me do this and let me do that. And so that's very uh, rough, inaccurate, but that's kind of a seat of the pants of how they do it. And since they're moving, uh, they get a rough idea of how deep and where it is. And at the same time, the cameras, you've got a structural engineer looking over the shoulders going, oh, the slabs there, we can't put, we, we can't, oh, that's really braced. I can come in from this side and more quickly extricate and move stuff without causing a collapse. But you're right, the big problem is we don't have good odometry. And we say, oh, I can do visual slam. And it's like, well, one, sure, but I've never, I mean, certainly we've gotten some excellent work that's been done, and particularly the David Scarmizis group. But as you start with ground robots, you start losing the odometry very quickly with those surface properties. And you have so many turns and twists, and sometimes you don't even have contact. I mean, some of these voids open up. And that, that was a challenge for one of the snake robots, the really super small snake robot, the active scope camera, is that they found that they could go through a void and then all of a sudden the void, you know, they need contact to squish and get through. And then all of a sudden they get to an area that's very wide and what to do. So they put little air jets so that they could, you know, use the air to kind of push the robot through till it got to another void that they had contact where it could go back to being a snake. Hi, thanks. And if I might add in an extra question, uh, let's let's assume that you've got these hybrid robots um, and they're all absolutely fantastic and they can do a job, um, but they're specialist robots. How do you quickly get those to a disaster site? How how things be geared up to uh, to get the specialist equipment to a site in a meaningful and useful period of time? 
You know, there, there's a couple of answers to that. The, the, the quick glib answer, Clive, is you don't. I mean, the, the first three days of the disaster are the most critical. After about 52 hours, your survivors typically are dead. They're no longer survivors. So what you have from the regional, uh, our state, our provincial teams, search and rescue teams get called in, the, the specialists are called in. What you have on site within about four to 12 hours is really what you're using during the critical part. So if they don't have it within 12 hours, they don't have it. Now, specialist equipment, you're flying it from Japan. I mean, I looked at some of this stuff and said, oh, the active scope camera, it's in Japan. It'll get there in three days. So we could bring it in, but it'll just mostly, you know, at that point, showing it off, not, not really expect, it's, it's lost its timing to make an impact. What we find is what they have, what the local fire and police departments have or the regional teams have is what they bring. That F6A, terrible choice, top heavy. I wouldn't, you know, as they found, they can't really put it over something that's not level. It's built to be uh, where, where it's level ground, didn't work. But it's what the police, the Miami-Dade Police Department had, so they it was easy to bring. So we need to get these specialized robots available. Well, the only way we make them available is make them not specialized. That what we find the UAVs that were being used are used for structure fires, but they're used for photography. Everybody's very familiar with them. They're ubiquitous. The majority of ones we use were $1,000. You, you order them off of Amazon. So everybody's familiar with them. They're in common use. There's lots of apps. People trust them. They've used, you know, it's all good. Whereas specialty robots, not so much. So the trick is, can what are the applications for robot ferrets? You know, what are the applications? You know, we're seeing spot right now. Spot can be used for everything. Okay, uh, we're... But if it is, if that's true, then, then that would make it easier to use Spot or a mini miniature version of Spot in Rubble. Cool. Fine, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Evgenia Magic, you have a question? Uh, dear Robin, it's always a great pleasure to listen to your lectures. And as always, it's a great and very interesting lecture. And I've got the following question. Uh, do you use simulations prior to real robot runs? You know, I rarely use simulations. We will simulate things like paths and sometimes behaviors to see that those are all working there, but for nothing, um, it's so hard to simulate field conditions. Uh, in the United States and also RoboCop Rescue uses the NIST test course and again, that, that gives you scale type of tests, but not all the not all the other things, the traversability, and a lot of times not a realistic high fidelity of the types of regions you get. And so it makes it tough to do a computer-based simulation. That's why I think these test beds are important, but the test beds need to have a higher physical fidelity. I see, okay, and may I ask another question about using of robot operating system ROS in the software of your robots? Do you use it? Uh, some of them we use ROS, some of them we, we are constrained by what the manufacturer does, right? You know, uh, uh, iRobot, Endeavor, Teledyne, Flare, whatever it is this week, uh, they don't, they have typically not used ROS, right? Uh, some of the other ones do use ROS. So I'm not seeing the, the uh, ROS or not ROS as a uh, problem or a disadvantage. Uh, it's more the physicality of the robots. Thank you very much. Any more questions? I have a question. <clears throat> so are there any devices which uh, are like a aircraft black box, which you purchase and That's plant on your question. Sure, the uh, best way to do this would be to just have uh, systems like these that you carry with you. 
they transmit a signal, maybe they use GPS or whatever to uh, send a signal saying, here I am. Are there any such devices? Oh yeah, yes, yes. In, in fact, the um, uh, uh, responders carry carry that. Uh, if you're working in a confined space or rubble, it'll actually sense when you you know kind of like your you know smartwatch. It'll let you. It'll start beeping and trying to send a signal to indicate that this person's not moving, and they need to. You need to do a status check on them to make sure they're okay. Now the problem with that is is that if you're working in rubble, you can imagine in that area, you start losing wireless connectivity, particularly if you're going underground, if you're in that, that garage area and stuff. And a lot of times, believe it or not, when you're a technical search specialist, you're standing there looking, going, what do I do now kind of thing? What's the best way around? So you tend to be long periods of time where you're standing thinking or sketching and then your alarm goes off so in practice a lot of people just turn it off the problem then becomes what do you do about the victims you know wouldn't it be great if everybody was wearing that you know some sort of device and that you could find and then of course uh you know and of course that nobody's going to care you know this happened at 1 30 in the morning uh people literally and and it was 1 30 in the morning and the shear on the standing portion turned out to be where most of the condos had bedrooms. So even, you know, worse, you're in bed, you're literally falling out. So unless you were sleeping with it, you know, around your neck, you're like an old person where you have one of those, the sensors, it would have been a real problem. Or if it is planted under your skin somewhere. Ah, well, sure. And then I, if we do that, I'm, I want to be chipped. I want the, I want the wireless string and I want really good internet, and, you know, stuff so I can be checking all my email while we're doing stuff. Yeah, but then all the big boys will be, uh, the big boss will be monitoring you too also. That's the risk, isn't it? I know that's kind of the, that's kind of the problem with if, if everybody allowed themselves to be constantly surveilled, wouldn't life be easier to keep up with where everybody is? So that may not be the best solution, but yeah, yeah. So there are technologies they have been looked at. Um, you know, after, uh, after the Kobe earthquake, uh, Japan had a real interesting push for that, that I could see talk, going to some of the response conferences, you know, oh, people should wear emitters and they should have this, you know, um, and it's just hard. Any more questions? Okay, it looks like um, I've got, I think they've asked a question. So thank you very much, uh, Robin. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, meeting you in virtual sort of mode and hope to see you again in future Cloud conferences uh, in a physical mode, uh, hopefully. And, uh, so thank you very much for, of course, making it to so early, of course, and you're located as well. Thank so, you very uh, much for having me. And I hope this is of use to you. And if you have technologies you want to try out, we're going to have that exercise at Disaster City. And we would love to collaborate with you to take some of the things that we've learned and take all the fantastic work that you all are doing and adapting it here. So. Sure, sure. Thank you very much. So we are now going into um, uh, a, um, a break mode. So um, the next session will start in about 15, 20 minutes time, I think.
GPS or whatever to uh, send a signal saying, here I am. Are there any such devices? Oh, yeah, yes, yes. In, in fact, the um, uh, uh, responders carry, carry that. Uh, if you're working in a confined space or rubble, it'll actually sense when you, you know, kind of like your you know, smartwatch, it'll let you, it'll start beeping and trying to send a signal to indicate that this person's not moving and they need to, you need to do a status check on them to make sure they're okay. Now, the problem with that is, is that if you're working in rubble, you can imagine in that area, you start losing wireless connectivity, particularly if you're going underground, if you're in that, that garage area and stuff. And a lot of times, believe it or not, when you're a technical search specialist, you're standing there looking, going, what do I do now kind of thing? What's the best way around? So you tend to be long periods of time where you're standing thinking or sketching and then your alarm goes off. So in practice, a lot of people just turn it off. The problem then becomes, what do you do about the victims? You know, wouldn't it be great if everybody was wearing that, you know, some sort of device and that you could find. And then of course, uh, you know, and of course that nobody's gonna care. You know, this happened at 1.30 in the morning. Uh, people literally, and, and it was 1.30 in the morning and the shear on the standing portion turned out to be where most of the condos had bedrooms. So even, you know, worse, you're in bed, you're literally falling out. So unless you were sleeping with it, you know, around your neck, you're like an old person where you have one of those, the sensors, it would have been a real problem. Or if it is planted under your skin somewhere. Ah, well, sure. And then I, if we do that, I'm, I want to be chipped. I want the, I want the wireless string and I want really good internet and, you know, stuff so I can be checking all my email while we're doing stuff. Yeah, but then all the big boys will be, uh, the big boss will be monitoring you too also. That's the risk, isn't it? I know that's kind of the that's kind of the problem with if if everybody allowed themselves to be constantly surveilled, wouldn't life be easier to keep up with where everybody is? So that may not be the best solution, but yeah, yeah. So there are technologies they have been looked at. Um, you know, after uh, after the Kobe earthquake, uh, Japan had a real interesting push for that that I could see talk, going to some of the response conferences you know oh, people should wear emitters and they should have this you know um, and it's just hard any more questions okay it looks like um I've got attendee who has a question. So thank you very much, uh, Robin. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, meeting you in virtual sort of mode and hope to see you again in future Cloud conferences uh, in a physical mode, uh, hopefully. And, uh, so thank you very much for, of course, making it uh, so early, of course, in your location <laughs> as well. Thank so, you very uh, much for having me. And I hope this is of use to you. And if you have technologies you want to try out, we're going to have that exercise at Disaster City. And we would love to collaborate with you to take some of the things that we've learned and take all the fantastic work that you all are doing and adapting it here. So. Sure, sure. Right Thank you very much. So we are now going into um, uh, a, um, a break mode. So um, the next session will start in about 15 20 minutes time, I think. <laughs>